Hello everyone, welcome to our second to last week of school. I am your teacher, Mr. Rittenauer, and we are going to begin with some common sense. So click the YouTube button below if you'd like to make this video bigger. All right, so today's common sense lesson. When speaking to an adult, show them respect by addressing them as Mr., Mrs., or Miss, and then their last name. If you do not know their last name, call them sir or ma'am. If an adult wants you to call them by their first name, like Charlie or Charlotte, it is appropriate to call them Mr. Charlie or Mrs. Charlotte. These are some um, pretty basic uh, signs of respect that kids can give adults. It's polite to say Mr. Rittenauer and not call me by my first name. Or if you have permission from somebody to use their first name. So for me, if I said, yeah, you can call me Caleb, it would be out of respect for me that you would say Mr. Caleb rather than just Caleb. All right, boys and girls. So hopefully your parents have already taught you that. But if they haven't explicitly taught you that, now you know the rule. All right, words of wisdom. Show respect. All right, so... For the last 10 days of school, we are going to take the uh, Go Math third grade uh, final. So what does that mean? Well, um, let me make myself big here. So Go Math has a final test um, that covers everything from third grade all in one test. And we have 10 days of school left. This happens to be 10 pages long. So we're just going to do a page each day. Uh, for those of you that are not sure what a final is, well, get used to them because you start, you're going to have to start taking them every year, uh, all the way up through college even. A final is a test that you take at the very end of the year. It's the final test, hence the name final. And it has questions from the entire year to see how much you've learned. All right, so I want to see how much you've learned. This is obviously not graded. It is just for practice. Um, and you do not have it in front of you. It's in those little test booklets that we had in the back of the room. Um, so no, nobody has them. Uh, but you can take this using just a pencil and paper, and you can draw, do your scratch work, and you can write down what letter you think the answer might be before we go over it, if you'd like. Okay, so let's do page one together right now. All right, so... First strategy I've taught you all school year is to highlight or underline important information. Number one, Clara looked at the clock on her way to band practice. What time is shown on Clara's clock? So this one's pretty straightforward question, right? I'm just finding out what the time is. So let's look at the minute hand first. So the minute hand is the longer one, right? It is pointing at the second hash mark past the nine. So if the nine is equal to how many minutes? Well, each number is worth five on the clock. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. 45, so now I've got to go two more minutes past 45. 46, 47. So I'm at 47 is my minutes. Now I'm in the danger zone. So my hour hand is the little one. It looks like it's pointing almost to the four, but we know that it's not quite to the four, which means it's still three. So it's 347. Let's look at our answer choices. Oh no, none of my answer choices have it written in digital form, 347. Now I have to use word form to try to figure out my answer. So let's read letter A. It says 13 minutes before three. So what's 13 minutes before three o'clock? So if I go back in time from three o'clock 
and I go 13 minutes backwards. That's like taking away 13 minutes. So how many minutes are in an hour? 60, right? So whenever I try to subtract and I have to go over and regroup, I can't do 0 minus 3, so I've got to go regroup. Now normally this would look like this, 9, and then this would become a 10, right? But with time, it's not the same thing. When you regroup an hour, you only take out 60 minutes. Remember that from earlier in the school year? It's kind of kind of a tricky thing. So let me use my purple pen now. So I've regrouped and I've made three o'clock really 260, right? That's two hours and then 60 would be a full hour in the ones place. So 60 minus my, sorry, the minutes place, minus my 13, now I can do that. Let's regroup now the regular way. 10 minus three is seven, five minus one is four, Four and I've got zero hours, so 247. So letter A is 247, and then let's erase here. 247. Uh oh, looks like 347 is my answer, so I know that letter A is not correct because. 247 is an hour off. So let me take my pen and draw a line through that. Okay, letter B. It says 13 minutes after 3. So if it's 13 minutes after 3, I'm adding 13 minutes to 3 o'clock. And look at that, that's a lot easier than the last one. 313 is 313. The same as 347? Nope. So let's put that there and cross off that answer because we know it is not right. Okay, letter C. It says 13 minutes before 4 o'clock. So if it's 4 o'clock and I have to go 13 minutes before, I have to take away. Now it's just like the last problem that we did. We are going to regroup, because I can't take 13 away from 0. But I can take 13 away from 60 minutes. Do you see how I took an hour out of my 4 and made it 60 minutes? That's what that was for, okay? So I've just regrouped, and now I can do 60 minus 13. 60 minus 13 is 47. And then 3 minus nothing is 347. Would you look at that, boys and girls? 3. Oh, whoops. I'm just going to rewrite it. 347. Three forty-seven is what we got for our answer, so we know that C is the correct answer. And if we wanted to, we could just quickly solve this last one. It says 45 minutes after 3. So that's 45 minutes added on to 3 o'clock. That's easy. 345, which we know is not the right answer. All right. Number 2. Omar started that's important, his math homework at 4.20 p.m. He finished his math homework at 4.44. How long did Omar do his math? So I'm going to try to find the difference between my two times. So if he starts at 4.20 and he's going to 4.44, I can either skip count forward or I can find the difference. So let me do 
do the skip count forward way first. So I want to get to 444. Let's add 10 minutes at a time. So plus 10. Now I'm at 430. Plus another 10. Now I'm at 440. And then how do I get to 444? Plus 4. Now I'm at 444. So I can take each one of these, plus 4, plus 10, and plus 10, and add them up. So let's do it. 10 plus 10 is 20, right? 20 plus 4 is 24 minutes. So 24 minutes is letter B. So this is what we got using our skip count method. Now let's try just straight up subtraction, finding a difference here. So 4 minus 0 is 2. So 4 minus 0 is 4. 4 minus 2 is 2. And then 4 minus 4 is 0 hours and 24 minutes. Hey, that's the same thing that we got using our other way. So letter B is correct. Great work, boys and girls. Let's move on to number three. Mrs. Crocker, first name Betty, fills a container with 17 liters of water. So liters are smaller than gallons, if you remember that. Your water bottles that you kept on your desk were usually about one liter. So, oh, undo, I'm sorry. 17 liters of water. She then... That's kind of important. Fills another container with 24 liters. What is the total liquid volume in both containers? So once I see that word total, I know I'm adding almost 100% of the time. So 17 in bottle 1, 24 in bottle 2. Let's add them up here. 7 plus 4 is 11. 1 plus 1 plus 2 is so my answer, 41 liters. That one was quite simple. All right, so this one we're going to need a ruler, huh? Travis uses an inch ruler to measure a ribbon. What is the length of the ribbon to the nearest fourth of an inch? So let's bust out a ruler. Okay, so I've got my ruler here, and I need to make sure that my ruler is the right, I'm on the right side of the ruler, so now I'm on the inches side, and let me just shrink this guy down just a wee bit more. Oh, sorry, I mean, let me make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, a little bit bigger. Okay, so take a look here how I set up my ruler so that the start is right on the zero line. Sometimes kids like to start their ruler on the edge, but not all rulers start at zero, remember? So I've got mine lined up so it's perfectly at the zero. Now let's look at the line right here. This is where my ribbon ends. So my ribbon and the yellow line. Well, let's look at my options. One and a half inches. Let's mark one and a half inches. Right here is one and a half. One and a. I'm sorry, that was one and a quarter. Right here is one and a half. 
and one inch is right here and then one quarter inch right here so which is it closest to is my yellow line is it closest to one and a half which is purple or one in sorry one and a quarter which is purple or one and a half which is green well it's closer to the green so it's closer to one and a half these ones are hard to do without virtually it's a lot easier to do these together in class so I apologize for that one number five the pep club sells water bottles during the school football games the pep club sold 146 bottles during last Friday's game and 231 bo water bottles during this Friday's game. How many water bottles did they sell all together? So what operation do you think that says all together? Yeah, I'm gonna need to add, right? I'm gonna have to take last Friday's and combine it with this Friday's. So go ahead, let's do the math here. Six plus one is, four plus three is, one plus two is, so is there an answer for 377? Yes, there is. Boom, boom. That's it. That's all the math today. Congratulations. Let's move on to some U.S. history. So, um, oops, sorry, that's tomorrow's. So if you remember, last week we talked about the uh, Vietnam War and the Vietnam War was a time period um, where uh, the Cold War was at its most extreme um, the battle between the United States and democracy versus the Soviet Union and China and communism and the Vietnam War took place during the 60s and into the 70s. So while that's happening, um, there's another major movement happening in America as well. And no, I'm not talking about the hippie movement. I'm talking about the civil rights movement. And it's something that you probably have talked about before in second grade, but it's, um, it's a major, major event in U.S. history that deserves our attention. Um, it certainly is one of the most, in the top 40 most important events in U.S. history. So let's dive into the Civil Rights Movement today, and um, then next time we will uh, jump to the 1970s. So to start with, rather than me read, I am going to show you a short video on the Civil Rights Movement. African-American struggle for equal rights began when the Civil War ended. Slavery was outlawed, but in the Deep South, Jim Crow laws segregated whites and African-Americans. In the early 1900s, W.E.B. Du Bois and others created the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. The goal of the NAACP was to challenge racist laws in court. NAACP action brought many important civil rights cases to the Supreme Court. In 1951, African-American Oliver Brown sued his local school board because his daughter was forced to travel a great distance to attend an African-American school when a white school stood only blocks from his house. Okay, so I'm going to pause here a couple times during this video to help uh, teach some of these concepts. So in the late 1800s, after the Civil War, um, you probably remember from earlier in U.S. history, Abraham Lincoln, at the end of the Civil War, had a plan to put the pieces back together for our country. Well, whenever he was shot in the back of the head by, anyone remember? John Wilkes Booth. Uh, 
the person that took over for Abraham Lincoln, um, his name was Andrew Johnson, he did not put the pieces back together properly like Abraham Lincoln had in mind. And so what happened was, rather than um, the wound of slavery and racism, rather than heal it properly by stitching it up, instead they slapped a big old band-aid on it. And you know what happens whenever you do that? Well, it gets infected and just gets worse, right? And so that's what happened after, um, after the Civil War. The Band-Aid got put on, and very quickly, things in the South went back to the way that they were. And in some cases, it was even worse because there were a lot of Black people living in the South, hence um, why there was slavery in the South, because that's the Black um, Americans, once they were freed, they didn't have any money to travel. Um, some of them, you know, liked living down in the South. Some of them, uh, many African Americans, um, actually ended up staying and working for a wage. That means they got paid on the same farms that they were slaves on. So what do you think the former slave owners, not what do you think, but how do you think they treated their uh, the black people in the South? What do you think? Do you think they were like, okay, now that slavery's over, I'm going to give you a hug and love you? No. No. They actually treated uh, black people almost worse than whenever they were slaves because now they're not getting anything in return and they think that slaves are less than humans. Um, and black people are less than human beings. They think that a lot of white people in the South thought that blacks were, were equivalent to animals or dogs. And so in the South, black people were treated very poorly by a lot of white people. Um, really poorly. Like, I'm talking like if you saw someone on the street, you would throw things at them or... Uh, call them bad words, not allow them to come into restaurants. Um, in some cases, they would even, uh, this is terrible, but they would lynch, which means they would um, gather together, usually at nighttime, and kidnap African Americans and hang them, and sometimes even set their bodies on fire. So some evil, terrible stuff is happening in our country, and the problem is, no one's really doing anything about it because these black people don't really have much of a voice. Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like if you were uh, there's a whole bunch of adults and you're like the only kid and you see someone um, doing something really bad, like robbing the house. And you go up to all the adults, you're like, someone's robbing the house. And all the adults are like, okay, honey, go play in your room. That's kind of what's happening to black people. There's something terrible that's happening, but no one's really listening because, you know, no one really cares. Just like a group of adults might not really care or think much of what a kid has to say. Um, and obviously, you can tell that's, that's not good. That's wrong. Um, and so part of U.S. history is fixing things that were wrong. And that's what this whole time period is about, is fixing things. So it took almost 80 years um, to fix something that was majorly wrong. And that was exactly what you're doing right now, school, all right? School in the 19, late 1800s was um, only black and only white. There was no, uh, there was no schools for both black and white kids in most of the South. So you all in my class are white, so you all go to the same school. But then um, think about some of the other kids in your grade that are not. Some of the um, black students, they would not be allowed to go to school with you. And do you think that that's right? No, 
you should never treat someone differently just because the pigment color of their skin. That's ridiculous. But that's what it was like. And so there was a man uh, who had a daughter and he lived right, basically right across the street from a white school and his daughter was black. And he was forced to take her like miles and miles and miles away to an all black school. And he had a big problem with that, like most of us would. And his um, his uh, claim that he made was denied. He wasn't allowed to take his daughter to the white school across the street. So he fought, and thank goodness in America we have the justice system, which is whenever there's a law um, that is put into place, you have the right to challenge that law in the court and let the judges decide. And so his case got um, got put before the Supreme Court, that's the highest court in the whole country. And the Supreme Court decided in the favor of the dad that schools have to allow blacks and whites to attend if they live in certain areas. There's no more black only and white only schools. That is illegal. Then the term that we used a lot of times for that law is called Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws. So separate schools, as long as they're quote unquote equal was okay until Brown versus Board of Education until that Supreme Court case, where the Supreme Court, the highest law in the land, the highest court in the land, decided that is illegal. And so overnight after that court case, everything changed. No more discrimination in schools. Now, do you think that um, Southern white people, do you think that they said, oh, the Supreme Court changed their, they made the law so that you have to have blacks and whites in the same school. Do you think that they listened to that law? No, not really. Nope, it took actual physical force, sometimes even violence, to get the people to allow black, the white people to allow black kids in their schools. So you'll see there's a couple major examples of that happening in, um, in the South, including the Little Rock Nine, which were nine, um, black kids that wanted to go to a white school after it was deemed illegal and they were not allowed into the school and so the army had to come and uh, it was it almost turned into a battle between the arkansas state police versus the united states military which would have been terrible but thankfully in the end the white police officers backed down and allowed the black children to go in. So let's keep watching the video. On May 17, 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka that segregated schools were unconstitutional. The next year, it ordered Southern school boards to desegregate quickly. Desegregation faced great resistance. Orville Faubus, the governor of Arkansas, promised that segregation would continue in his state. When nine African-American students tried to attend a high school in Little Rock, Faubus called in the State National Guard to stop them. When violence erupted, President Eisenhower sent federal troops to restore the peace. Around this time, another effort to end segregation took place. In 1955, Rosa Parks was riding a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. She refused to give her seat to a white man, and so she was arrested. But well, we hope to achieve equal rights as any human being deserves. That's what we are working for. Martin Luther King Jr., a minister in the city, helped organize a boycott against the city buses. For more. Okay, so there is a pretty famous figure in the civil rights movement just mentioned. Um, Let's see if you remember her name. They just said it. She was the woman who refused to give up her seat. Yep, Rosa Parks. And 
Rosa Parks, refusing to give up her seat, kickstarted a movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. to boycott the use of buses in Alabama and Montgomery. So think about it. Most of the um, buses that you've been on have probably been school buses because you live in a rural town. But if you live in a city, a lot of times you have to take a bus to get from place to place because a lot of people in the city didn't, don't have cars. Still to this day, a lot of people don't have cars. And most cities don't have subways either. So you take buses. Now, the city of Montgomery, Alabama is significantly black population. A lot of black people live there. And so whenever Martin Luther King Jr. led this boycott, think about the bus company. If a lot, if not most of their um, riders are black, how are they going to make money if all the black people decide not to ride the bus? So after a couple months of this, the bus company decided, well, we're losing money like crazy. We can't afford this. So we're going to finally, we're just going to give in to the black folk and Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. And we're just going to get rid of our segregated bus. So now if you come on the bus, you can sit wherever you want, black, white, doesn't matter. So that was a big success for the civil rights movement for the black people um, and uh, kind of kick-started some more things to come that we're going to watch now. More than a year, African Americans refused to ride the buses. On December 21, 1965, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation on buses was unconstitutional. These important events began a peaceful movement that aimed to end unequal treatment for African Americans. Dr. King was a leading force in that movement. On August 28, 1963, King led 250,000 civil rights activists in the March on Washington, D.C. At the end of the march, King delivered one of his most celebrated speeches. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. At the urging of President Johnson. Okay, so I start to get emotional sometimes when I hear that speech because, um, well, <laughs> it's just such an important moment in history um, where Martin Luther King, uh, he just calls out everyone. Um, and he just destroys the argument for slavery and for treating black people unequally. And it's not just black people that he talks about in the speech, too. He also talks about women. Martin Luther King Jr., a lot of times, is underrated as one of the most powerful feminist voices. He truly wanted every single person to treat each other with kindness. And um, it wasn't because that's what he wanted. It's because that's what God wanted. And Martin Luther King Jr. was a very religious man. He was a pastor, actually. And he would quote scripture all the time in his speeches, um, including in the I Have a Dream speech. He talks about just how far our country has come and how we are so close to overcoming something that has been wrong since the start. And, um, you know, without Martin Luther King and the March on Washington, the civil rights acts of the 1960s that the government passes might not have gotten passed. Um, who knows if someone else would have come along after, but the way that Martin Luther King Jr. acted in a peaceful way, using wisdom and quoting scripture from the Bible, uh, it was just, it was really, it's hard to be against someone who's that intelligent and that um, has that much self-control. Because uh, there was other people at the time who were quote-unquote, you know, civil rights leaders, like Malcolm X, for instance. 
he was Malcolm X was uh, he went about trying to get equal rights by violently destroying things and by telling black people to kill white people he was much more radical and he was also he wasn't a Christian he was an Islamist uh, he, he was a Muslim who was very radical Martin Luther King not so much he wasn't really radical at, in the sense that he was violent he was more radical as in well he wasn't really radical at all he was more calm and just confident and he believed he was like Moses um, in the Old Testament leading the Jews out of out of Israel or out of Egypt he just like had this presence about him and he knew that he was right and it convinced a lot of people as it should have um, their protest in Washington DC drew a lot of people and got the government the, the legislative branch Congress to finally pass some laws that Lyndon Johnson the president at the time um, signed giving blacks equal equal rights to whites like the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 both of those were huge they were allowed they allowed black people to vote um, in the south without any anyone getting in their way and so after that you start to see a lot more african-american congressmen governors mayors um, even senators come out of the south so let's keep watching congress passed the civil rights act of 1964 this law banned discrimination in all public facilities and in employment African Americans next turned their attention to winning voting rights. A group of college students called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, staged what they called Freedom Summer. The group enlisted hundreds of volunteers to register African Americans to vote in Mississippi. The murder of three of these volunteers bolstered the fight for equal rights and motivated King to plan a march from Selma to Montgomery in Alabama. On Sunday, March 7, 1965, King led a group of protesters over a bridge to begin the march. Alabama's governor, George Wallace, sent state troopers to prevent the marchers from crossing. Police beat the marchers, giving the event the name Bloody Sunday. The nation was shocked, and President Lyndon Johnson announced a new policy aimed at winning African Americans the right to vote. Okay, so remember how last week we talked about the Vietnam era and how television made a big difference? Well, that's the perfect example, that last little bit that they're showing you with the police and their beating the crowd with their clubs and the dogs attacking. That's the perfect example of how television really changed a lot of the minds of the North. Um, because all this is happening in the South, so the North doesn't really know what's going on. Like, they, can, they kind of hear things, but they don't really, like, it's hard to visualize that kind of stuff. Well, once you got TV broadcast um, showing what's happening, like in that Selma march where George Wallace sent all those dogs on those um, marchers, it's once you see that then you start to really get that feeling like you know like hey that's wrong and that's what happened really um throughout the 60s or uh especially 1963 and 1964 as you see a lot of news coverage of the civil rights movement and that really changed lawmakers decisions it made them focus on what was going on with martin luther king and you know other important you know african-american leaders and uh, another thing to point out too is we're all white uh, including myself the civil rights movement was not just a black person led movement there was a lot of white people involved too um, there's a lot of white uh, women especially uh, who were marching right alongside with the black protesters um, it, it wasn't just only black people were fighting for black people rights. It was both white people and black people. Um, so anyway, you'll see here in behind me, there's President 
Lyndon Johnson, he puts into law um, a couple of really important civil rights uh, laws that we still have today that prevent discrimination. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Congress did pass the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and Johnson signed it into law. But the struggle for civil rights continued. In 1968, Martin Luther King was rallying support for a campaign to help the poor. On April 3rd of that year, he was standing on a motel balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, when an assassin took his life. The civil rights movement had many triumphs and many tragedies. But leaders like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. helped win for African Americans the equal rights promised to all Americans. Okay, so just so that we have enough time to um, talk about the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and, you know, finish U.S. history today, I'm just going to push us a little bit longer here for about five more minutes and then I'll be done. So uh, let's just take a look at some of the pictures. It's a great one of Martin Luther King Jr. at the March on Washington, which happened in I believe it was 1963. So you can see in the background, let me see if I get my pen to work. You can see right back here, the Washington Monument, um, a beacon or a pillar, you could say, of, of American freedom. So it only makes sense that MLK would be speaking right in front of Washington symbol of freedom and then right in front of right back here if you can see on my screen like right behind where MLK would be is the Lincoln Memorial which is where if you look at the back of a penny you can see it. it's where um, you've got like these columns and then you can see Abraham Lincoln sitting in a chair right behind him. Sorry, that's a terrible drawing, but uh, it really kind of makes sense that MLK is standing right in front of Lincoln, who freed the slaves, facing Washington, who freed our country from the British, from the tyranny of a king. And so Martin Luther King is right in the middle. He's like, we've come so far, and here I am right in the middle of this, the greatest country in the world. And we're so close, but we just we need to take that last step, and we need equal rights for both black and whites. So that's pretty cool symbolism right there. Um, what else? Oh yeah, I have another picture of the rally. So I guess you could say the '60s was famous for protests. So you probably already know what a protest is. It looks like these pictures. It's whenever you get a group of people who stand outside some place that's um, usually where lawmakers are or you know, an important place, and they hold signs, and they shout things, um, and they try to disrupt whatever's happening. Now, protesting is, Ill is totally illegal in America as long as you apply for a permit. Protesting is one of the great things that makes America free. America is America, because if you don't agree with something, you're allowed to vocalize that. You're allowed to say that you don't agree with it. All right, so you can see there's kind of two sides to the protest. There is the good guys fighting for freedom. Um, then there's the bad guys who were fighting for white power. And you can even see, look at my arrow, I'll draw, I'll draw another one in red. But some of the people that did not want uh, to end segregation, or segregation means whenever you have separate white and black, right? People that were fighting for separate black and white things, um, <laughs> what even worth? Look at that. You remember that symbol? That's from Hitler, right? That's the Nazi symbol. 
It's called a swastika, right? White power. So these people were not good people. All right. So I'm going to leave that up here. I've got a quick little quiz here. Um, assuming you know a person because of their race or their looks, what's this called? Whenever you assume that you know someone based on their race, is that called Malcolm X? No, this is Thurgood Marshall. Is it racism? Maybe. Rosa Parks, Prejudice, Martin Luther King Jr., a Stereotype, or Civil Rights. Well, whenever you assume that you know someone just based on what they look like, that is called Stereotype. Stereotyping. So if you see someone that is wearing like really raggedy clothes, um, crazy dirty fingernails, their hair is just like wild animal looking like hair, you might stereotype them as someone who is poor, right? Someone who doesn't have a lot of money. But what if that person that you saw was actually not a poor person, what if it was somebody who just got done um, doing some yard work? You know, you don't know who that person is. Maybe that's the richest kid in the world and they just survived a month on a deserted island or something. And that's why they look all ratty. You don't know. That's why in general, it's always a good idea not to stereotype. All right. Stereotyping only leads to uh, to hurt and hate. Okay, next. Who was the Supreme Court Justice who fought for equality? Well, Thurgood Marshall we talked about earlier this school year. He was the first African American on the Supreme Court. He was also the lead prosecutor in the Brown versus Board of Education um, landmark Supreme Court decision. All right, thinking the worst of someone before you get to know them. That is called prejudiced. Treating someone poorly because of the color of their skin is racism, right? Treating someone solely based off their skin color is racist. And it works both ways, honestly. Like a lot of times I hear people talk about racism uh, only against black people, but it works the opposite way too. They, you can be racist against a white person. Uh, it, nothing drives me cra more crazy whenever um, black people treat white people differently because they're white. That's racist too. It works both ways. And it works against other cultures besides just white and black. Like treating someone poorly be or treating someone yeah poorly because they're um, brown, they're Mexican, is also racist too. Or assuming that because you're Chinese or Asian, that you're like some some kind of like really hard worker and genius. That that's racist too, because that's a stereotype. Okay, almost done. Who was the leader of the civil rights movement? Martin Luther King. Freedoms and laws between citizens and the government. That is civil rights. Refusing to give up her seat was Rosa Parks and the Islamic African American leader who provided violent self defense tactics. That was Malcolm X, and we didn't really talk about Malcolm X too much, but Malcolm X led a group called the Black Panthers, and his tactics were a lot more um, violent than Martin Luther King Jr.'s, which is kind of why he was not as successful. Um, he wasn't as good of a leader, and if we've learned anything from history, the best way to get your message across is almost 100% of the time, peace, peacefully, um, not violently. Um, there are exceptions to that in American history where violence was necessary, but ultimately it wasn't the violence of Malcolm X, it was the peace of Martin Luther King Jr. 
Okay, so let me take a quick peek up here and make sure I covered everything. Okay, so last thing I'll leave you with then, I think I got everything, but this time period during the sixth, early 60s is called the Civil Rights Movement. It's the time period when black uh, rights were um, being fought for as equal rights to whites. That's that's what this is, the Civil Rights Movement. So think about it, you've got, after World War II, you've got the Cold War starting, USA versus Soviet Union, and while that's happening, you've got Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, and then while that's happening, you've got the Civil Rights Movement. So you've got a whole bunch of things happening all at the same time in America, all right? It's kind of confusing, I know, but it's so important that you understand that the civil rights movement changed the, the country that we are today in a good way. Um, it made our country better. And not every single movement has made our country better. Like Vietnam, not really so much. The civil rights movement, though, definitely. And uh, you'll see here, whenever we talk tomorrow about the 1970s, you'll see that there's a lot of good things and a lot of bad things that came out of the 70s just like the 1960s. So that's what I will leave you with today, and I will see you back here tomorrow. All right, love you guys. Bye.